Chapter Six, Cedar Keys. October twenty-three. Today I reached the sea. While I was yet many miles back in the palmy woods, I caught the scent of the salt sea breeze, which, although I had so many years lived far from sea breezes, suddenly conjured up Dunbar its rocky coast, winds, and waves, and my whole childhood, that seemed to have utterly vanished in the new world, was now restored amid the Florida woods by that one breath from the sea. Forgotten were the palms and magnolias and the thousand flowers that enclosed me. I could see only dulse and tangle, long-winged gulls, the bass rock in the firth of forth, and the old castle, schools, churches, and long country rambles in search of bird's nests. I do not wonder that the weary camels coming from the scorching African deserts should be able to scent the Nile. How imperishable are all the impressions that ever vibrate one's life! We cannot forget anything. Memories may escape the action of will, may sleep a long time, but when stirred by the right influence, though that influence be light as a shadow, they flash into full stature and life with everything in place. For nineteen years my vision was bounded by forests, but today— Emerging from a multitude of tropical plants, I beheld the Gulf of Mexico stretching away unbounded, except by the sky. What dreams and speculative matter for thought arose as I stood on the strand, gazing out on the burnished, treeless plain. But now at the seaside I was in difficulty. I had reached a point that I could not ford, and Cedar Keys had an empty harbor. Would I proceed down the peninsula to Tampa and Key West? where I would be sure to find a vessel for Cuba, or would I wait here, like Crusoe, and pray for a ship? Full of these thoughts, I stepped into a little store which had considerable trade in quinine and alligator and rattlesnake skins and inquired about shipping, means of travel, etc. The proprietor informed me that one of several sawmills near the village was running and that a schooner chartered to carry a load of lumber to Galveston, Texas, was expected at the mills for a load. This mill was situated on a tongue of land a few miles along the coast from Cedar Keys, and I determined to see Mr. Hodgson, the owner, to find out particulars about the expected schooner, the time she would take to load, and whether I would be likely to obtain passage on her, etc. Found Mr. Hodgson at his mill, stated my case, and was kindly furnished the desired information. I determined to wait the two weeks likely to elapse before she sailed, and go on her to the flowery plains of Texas, from any of whose parts, I fancied, I could easily find passage to the West Indies. I agreed to work for Mr. Hodgson in the mill until I sailed, as I had but little money. He invited me to his spacious house, which occupied a shell hillock and commanded a fine view of the gulf and many gems of palmy inlets, called keys, that fringed the shore like huge bouquets, not too big, however, for the spacious waters." Mr. Hodgson's family welcomed me with that open, unconstrained cordiality which is characteristic of the better class of southern people. At the sawmill a new cover had been put on the main driving pulley, which, made of rough plank, had to be turned off and smoothed. He asked me if I was able to do this job, and I told him that I could. Fixing a rest and making a tool out of an old file, I directed the engineer to start the engine and run slow. After turning down the pulley and getting it true— I put a keen edge on a common carpenter's plane, quickly finished the job, and was assigned a bunk in one of the employees' lodging houses. The next day I felt a strange dullness and headache while I was botanizing along the coast. Thinking that a bath in the salt water might refresh me, I plunged in and swam a little distance, but this seemed only to make me feel worse. I felt anxious for something sour, and walked back to the village to buy lemons. Thus, and here, my long walk was interrupted— I thought that a few days' sail would land me among the famous flower-beds of Texas, but the expected ship came and went while I was helpless with fever. The very day after reaching the sea I began to be weighed down by inexorable leaden numbness, which I resisted, and tried to shake off for three days by bathing in the gulf, by dragging myself among the palms, plants, and strange shells of the shore, and by doing a little mill-work. I did not fear any serious illness, for I never was sick before." and was unwilling to pay attention to my feelings. But yet heavier and more remorselessly pressed the growing fever, rapidly gaining on my strength. On the third day after my arrival, I could not take any nourishment, but craved acid. Cedar Keys was only a mile or two distant, 
and I managed to walk there to buy lemons. On returning, about the middle of the afternoon, the fever broke on me like a storm, and before I had staggered halfway to the mill I fell down unconscious on the narrow trail among dwarf palmettos. When I awoke from the hot fever sleep, the stars were shining, and I was at a loss to know which end of the trail to take, but fortunately, as it afterwards proved, I guessed right. Subsequently, as I fell again and again after walking only a hundred yards or so, I was careful to lie with my head in the direction in which I thought the mill was. I rose, staggered, and fell, I know not how many times, in delirious bewilderment, gasping and throbbing with only moments of consciousness. Thus passed the hours till after midnight, when I reached the mill lodging-house. The watchman on his rounds found me lying on a heap of sawdust at the foot of the stairs. I asked him to assist me up the steps to bed, but he thought my difficulty was only intoxication and refused to help me. The mill hands, especially on Saturday nights, often returned from the village drunk. This was the cause of the watchman's refusal. Feeling that I must get to bed, I made out to reach it on hands and knees, tumbled in after a desperate struggle, and immediately became oblivious to everything. I awoke at a strange hour on a strange day to hear Mr. Hodgson ask a watcher beside me whether I had yet spoken, and when he replied that I had not, he said, Well, you must keep on pouring in quinine. That's all we can do. How long I lay unconscious I never found out, but it must have been many days. Some time or other I was moved on a horse from the mill quarters to Mr. Hodgson's house, where I was nursed about three months with unfailing kindness, and to the skill and care of Mr. and Mrs. Hodgson I doubtless owe my life. Through quinine and calomel, in sorry abundance, with other milder medicines, my malarial fever became typhoid. I had night sweats, and my legs became like posts of the temper and consistency of clay on account of the dropsy. So on until January, a weary time. As soon as I was able to get out of bed, I crept away to the edge of the wood, and sat day after day beneath a moss-draped live oak, watching birds feeding on the shore when the tide was out. Later, as I gathered some strength, I sailed in a little skiff from one key to another. Nearly all the shrubs and trees here are evergreen, and a few of the smaller plants are in flower all winter. The principal trees on this cedar key are the juniper, long-leafed pine, and live oak. All of the latter, living and dead, are heavily draped with talansia, like those of Bonaventure. The leaf is oval, about two inches long, three-fourths of an inch wide, glossy and dark green above, pale beneath. The trunk is usually much divided, and is extremely unwedgeable. The specimen on the opposite page is growing in the dooryard of Mr. Hodgson's house. It is a grand old king, whose crown gleamed in the bright sky long ere the Spanish shipbuilders felled a single tree of this noble species. The live oaks of these keys divide empire with the long-leafed pine and palmetto, but in many places on the mainland there are large tracts exclusively occupied by them. Like the Bonaventure oaks, they have the upper side of their main spreading branches thickly planted with ferns, grasses, small saw palmettos, etc. There is also a dwarf oak here, which forms dense thickets. The oaks of this key are not, like those of the Wisconsin openings, growing on grassy slopes, but stand, sunk to the shoulders, in flowering magnolias, heathworts, etc. During my long sojourn here as a convalescent, I used to lie on my back for whole days beneath the ample arms of these great trees, listening to the winds and the birds. There is an extensive shallow on the coast, close by, which the receding tide exposes daily. This is the feeding ground of thousands of waders of all sizes, plumage, and language, and they make a lively picture and noise when they gather at the great family board to eat their daily bread so bountifully provided for them. Their leisure in time of high tide they spend in various ways and places. Some go in large flocks to reedy margins about the islands and wade and stand about quarreling or making sport, occasionally finding a stray mouthful to eat. Some stand on the mangroves of the solitary shore, now and then plunging into the water after a fish. Some go long journeys inland, up creeks and inlets. A few lonely old herons of solemn look and wing retire to favorite oaks. It was my delight to watch those old white sages of immaculate feather, as they stood erect, drowsing away the dull hours between tides, curtained by long skeins of talansia. 
white-bearded hermits gazing dreamily from dark caves could not appear more solemn or becomingly shrouded from the rest of their fellow beings one of the characteristic plants of these keys is the spanish bayonet a species of yucca about eight or ten feet in height and with a trunk of three or four inches in diameter when fully grown it belongs to the lily family and develops palm-like from terminal buds the stout leaves are very rigid sharp pointed and bayonet like by one of these leaves a man might be as seriously stabbed as by an army bayonet and woe to the luckless wanderer who dares to urge his way through these armed gardens after dark vegetable cats of many species will rob him of his clothes and claw his flesh while dwarf palmettos will saw his bones and the bayonets will glide to his joints and marrow without the smallest consideration for lord man the climate of these precious inlets is simply warm summer and warmer summer corresponding in time with winter and summer in the north the weather goes smoothly over the points of union betwixt the twin summers few of the storms are very loud or variable the average temperature during the day in december was about sixty five degrees in the shade but on one day a little damp snow fell cedar key is two and one half or three miles in diameter and its highest point is forty-four feet above mean tidewater. It is surrounded by scores of other keys, many of them looking like a clump of palms, arranged like a tasteful bouquet, and placed in the sea to be kept fresh. Others have quite a sprinkling of oaks and junipers, beautifully united with vines. Still others consist of shells, with a few grasses and mangroves, circled with a rim of rushes those which have sedgy margins furnish a favorite retreat for countless waders and divers especially for the pelicans that frequently whiten the shores like a ring of foam it is delightful to observe the assembling of these feathered people from the woods and reedy isles herons white as wave tops or blue as the sky winnowing the warm air on wide quiet wing pelicans coming with baskets to fill and the multitude of smaller sailors of the air swift as swallows gracefully taking their places at nature's family table for their daily bread happy birds the mockingbird is graceful in form and a fine singer plainly dressed rather familiar in habits frequently coming like robins to door sills for crumbs a noble fellow beloved by everybody wild geese are abundant in winter associated with brant some species of which i have never seen in the north also great flocks of robins morning doves bluebirds and the delightful brown thrashers a large number of the smaller birds are fine singers crows too are here some of them cawing with a foreign accent the common bobwhite quail i observed as far south as middle georgia lime key sketched on the opposite page is a fair specimen of the florida keys on this part of the coast a fragment of cactus opuntia sketched on another page is from the above-named key and is abundant there the fruit an inch in length is gathered and made into a sauce of which some people are fond this species forms thorny impenetrable thickets one joint that i measured was fifteen inches long the mainland of florida is less salubrious than the islands but no portion of this coast nor of the flat border which sweeps from maryland to texas is quite free from malaria all the inhabitants of this region whether black or white are liable to be prostrated by the ever-present fever and ague to say nothing of the plagues of cholera and yellow fever that come and go suddenly like storms prostrating the population and cutting gaps in it like hurricanes in woods the world we are told was made especially for man a presumption not supported by all the facts a numerous class of men are painfully astonished whenever they find anything living or dead in all god's universe which they cannot eat or render in some way what they call useful to themselves they have precise dogmatic insight of the intentions of the creator and it is hardly possible to be guilty of irreverence in speaking of their god any more than of heathen idols he is regarded as a civilized law-abiding gentleman in favor either of a republican form of government or of a limited monarchy believes in the literature and language of england is a warm supporter of the english constitution and sunday schools and missionary societies and is as purely a manufactured article as any puppet of a halfpenny theatre with such views of the creator it is of course not surprising that erroneous views should be entertained of the creation 
To such properly trimmed people, the sheep, for example, is an easy problem, food and clothing for us, eating grass and daisies white by divine appointment for this predestined purpose, on perceiving the demand for wool that would be occasioned by the eating of the apple in the Garden of Eden. In the same pleasant plan, whales are storehouses of oil for us, to help out the stars in lighting our dark way until the discovery of the Pennsylvania oil wells. Among plants, hemp, to say nothing of the cereals, is a case of evident destination for ships rigging, wrapping packages, and hanging the wicked. Cotton is another plain case of clothing. Iron was made for hammers and plows, and lead for bullets, all intended for us, and so of other small handfuls of insignificant things. But if we should ask these profound expositors of God's intentions, how about those man-eating animals, lions, tigers, alligators, which smack their lips over raw man? Or about those myriads of noxious insects that destroy labor and drink his blood? Doubtless man was intended for food and drink for all these? Oh, no, not at all. These are unresolvable difficulties connected with Eden's apple and the devil. Why does the water drown its lord? And why do so many minerals poison him? Why are so many plants and fishes deadly enemies? Why is the Lord of creation subjected to the same laws of life as his subjects? No, oh, all these things are satanic, or in some way connected with the first garden. Now, it never seems to occur to these far-seeing teachers that nature's object in making animals and plants might possibly be, first of all, the happiness of each one of them, not the creation of all for the happiness of one. Why should man value himself as more than a small part of the one great unit of creation? And what creature of all that the Lord has taken the pains to make is not essential to the completeness of that unit, the cosmos? The universe would be incomplete without man, but it would also be incomplete without the smallest transmicroscopic creature that dwells beyond our conceitful eyes and knowledge. From the dust of the earth, from the common elementary fund, the Creator has made Homo sapiens. From the same material He has made every other creature, however noxious and insignificant to us. They are earth-born companions and our fellow mortals. The fearfully good, the orthodox, of this laborious patchwork of modern civilization cry heresy on every one whose sympathies reach a single hair's breadth beyond the boundary epidermis of our own species. Not content with taking all of earth, they also claim the celestial country as the only ones who possess the kind of souls for which that imponderable empire was planned. This star, our own good earth, made many a successful journey around the heavens ere man was made, and whole kingdoms of creatures enjoyed existence and returned to dust ere man appeared to claim them. After human beings have also played their part in creation's plan, they too may disappear without any general burning or extraordinary commotion whatever. Plants are credited with but dim and uncertain sensation, and minerals with positively none at all. But why may not even a mineral arrangement of matter be endowed with sensation of a kind that we in our blind exclusive perfection can have no manner of communication with? But I have wandered from my object. I stated a page or two back that man claimed the earth was made for him, and I was going to say that venomous beasts, thorny plants, and deadly diseases of certain parts of the earth prove that the whole world was not made for him. When an animal from a tropical climate is taken to high latitudes, it may perish of cold, and we say that such an animal was never intended for so severe a climate. But when man betakes himself to sickly parts of the tropics and perishes, he cannot see that he was never intended for such deadly climates. No, he will rather accuse the first mother of the cause of the difficulty, though she may never have seen a fever district, or will consider it a providential chastisement for some self-invented form of sin. Furthermore, all uneatable and uncivilizable animals, and all plants which carry prickles, are deplorable evils which, according to closet researches of clergy, require the cleansing chemistry of universal planetary combustion. But more than aught else, mankind requires burning, as being in great part wicked, and if that transmundane furnace can be so applied and regulated, as to smelt and purify us into conformity with the rest of terrestrial creation, then the tophetization of the erratic genus Homo were consummation devoutly to be prayed for. But, 
glad to leave these ecclesiastical fires and blunders i joyfully return to the immortal truth and immortal beauty of nature end of chapter six